Hello again and welcome back. Um, this is week 36 on Connect and we actually only have three more weeks of school. Three more weeks of virtual learning and then it is a officially summer. I know it might feel like summer now because you're at home, but it will officially be summer in three weeks. Our last day of school is May 29th. I hope you saw the update that was posted on Dojo by Miss Huff. Um, they had talked about possibly extending to June 3rd and they took those days back. So our last official day of school is May 29th. Um, our grades are due into focus May 22nd, which is not this week, but the next. Um, the last day that I'm taking grades is Sunday, May 17th. So this is actually our last week of graded assignments which is crazy. Um, it has flown by. We are going to continue to have instructional videos and some things for you. We are starting the one and only Ivan this week, and we will finish this novel before the school year is over. So just because we don't have graded assignments after this week does not mean we just aren't doing anything at all. We will read this book because I know this was something we've talked about since the beginning of the school year. We talked about how this is becoming a movie and I really still wanted you guys to experience reading this novel um, with me even though we're not in class together. So um, this does seem like a thicker book but we've talked about it in Zoom sessions. It's told from the point of view of a gorilla named Ivan. So some of the pages are um, a little shorter and some of them are a little longer, so it really is not as long of a book as it seems because there are some illustrations in there, you can see as we go along, um, and some shorter pages, definitely. So this is going to be split up in three weeks. Um, we're gonna read about a third of the book over the next three weeks, and we will be finished with this the week of May 29th. This week you are taking your science benchmark test. So because of that, we are lightening our load in other classes, kind of like we did with diagnostics. Um, so you won't have as much work this week. Don't forget that this Friday, your AR goals, your 10 iReady lessons from April 6th to May 15th, and your quarter four reading projects are due this Friday, May 15th. If you have any questions, please send me a message on Dojo. The project is, is posted on Connect. Um, the 10 lessons have been accumulating since April 6th, so that's our, our time frame there is April 6th to May 15th. That's what I'm going to look at for those 10 past reading lessons on iReady. And your AR goal is specific to you. Remember, you can read books on Epic and then take AR tests on them on the um, Renaissance Place website, the Hosted 340, that long website that I've posted a few times on um, Dojo, and it is also posted on Connect. So this week for reading, you have um, only really one mandatory assignment based on our reading. And that assignment is the comprehension questions based off of how much we read this week. We are going to be reading to page 105, up to 105 this week. Um, and I have put the electronic copy of this book on Connect. Um, for your quarter four reading projects, which is due Friday, um, you're picking Frindle, The Chocolate Touch, or How to Eat Fried Worms. I've put the electronic copies of those books on Connect as well. So if you need to go back and look at those to complete your project, you can. So your only mandatory assignment this week is that you do the comprehension questions. Um, that's the only assignment based off of the novel. Now the other things are those goals and your project, which have been... Um, 
you've been working on those for a few weeks now. I know some of you have already turned in the projects and they are awesome. I love the creativity that I'm seeing. Um, and if you need to finish your iReady lessons or your AR goals, um, you need to finish those by Friday as well. I know some of you have already done that as well. So good job on this hard work. I know this virtual learning has been weird. It's been different. I miss you guys a lot. Every time I'm on Zoom, my heart just is swelling because I really miss you guys and getting to see you somehow is nice. Um, but I hope we get to see each other in person very soon. Um, we do have an optional assignment this week and it is your vocabulary study. You do have some vocab words this week um, and if you want some extra credit, you can do that vocabulary study and turn that in by Sunday, May 17th. It's a Google form, like always. Um, so I'm gonna review the vocabulary really quickly in case you do want to um, do that vocabulary study for extra credit. So we do have 10 vocab words this week as always. Our first vocabulary word is domain. A domain is an area of territory owned or controlled by someone. Um, in the zoo, there is a lion's domain. There is a penguin domain. It's the area that is owned or controlled by someone or something. Our second vocabulary word is forage. To forage means to search wi widely for food, to search all over, you are foraging for things. Our third vocabulary word is precision. To do things with pre precision means you're being precise. You're being exact and accurate. Um, you do things precisely when you do things with a lot of detail. You wanna be very careful to make sure you get it exact and accurate. Our fourth vocabulary word is undaunted. Undaunted means you are not intimidated or discouraged by difficulty or danger. It is, um, you're undaunted if you're really not scared of something um, based on how difficult or dangerous it is. Our fifth vocabulary word is excel. If you excel, it means you are exceptionally good at something. Excel, exceptional, they kind of sound similar. Um, it means you're really, really good at something. Our sixth vocabulary word is juvenile. A juvenile is, it can be used as a noun or an adjective. You could talk about someone as a juvenile, someone who is a young person or an animal, or you could say that um, there is a juvenile person or a juvenile behavior, and that means kind of childlike, a young person or animal. Our seventh vocabulary word is amends. Amends means to make up for a wrongdoing. You might say, um, you might hear your parents say, you need to make amends with your friend. And it means to make up for a wrongdoing. Kind of like apologize, but with an action. Our eighth vocabulary word is specimen. A specimen is an individual animal or plant used as an example of its species. Our ninth vocabulary word is murmurs. I think we've had this vocabulary word before and it is a softly spoken sound made by a person or a group of people. Our 10th vocabulary word, I love this word, it's contemplating. Contemplating is a fancy way of saying you're thinking about something. I'm contemplating what I'm gonna have for lunch. Usually it's a very deep thinking, but it just means to think about something. Like I said, you do have a vocabulary study that is optional if you want to do that um, for some extra credit. Your uh, weekly work for the novel is the comprehension questions based on what we read this week. And your goals and projects are due by Friday. Don't forget to take attendance daily. Every day you need to be taking attendance. And don't forget to do your art and PE participation surveys because those are for a grade as well. Everything else is optional. The things provided by resource teachers are great practice, but they are optional assignments. I will be on Zoom this week, Monday from 8 to 9 a.m. and Friday from 12.45 to 1.45. So if you have any questions about projects, about your goals, anything that may pertain to this week's assignments, just pop on to Zoom. Let me know if you can't make Zoom, send me a dojo message. We're going to go ahead and jump into the one and only Ivan. So before this book begins, it does have a quote, and it says, It is never too late to be what you might have been. 
by George Eliot. It does give us a little bit of a glossary here, and you guys know that a glossary is like a mini dictionary based on the words in a book. So I'm going to go over some of these. Chest beat is a repeated slapping of the chest with one or both hands in order to generate a loud sound, sometimes used by gorillas as a threat display to intimidate an opponent. A domain is a territory, one of our vocab words this week. The grunt, and it's got a capital G for grunt, is a snorting pig-like noise made by gorilla parents to express annoyance. A mee ball. A mee ball is dried excrement thrown at observers. If you've ever been to the zoo, or you've ever seen movies about the zoo, you know that monkeys and gorillas are known for throwing things that come out of their body and Ivan calls it a meatball. 9,855 days is an example. It says while gorillas in the wild typically gauge the passing of time based on seasons or food availability, Ivan has adopted a tally of days. So 9,855 days is equal to 27 years. A knot tag is a stuffed toy gorilla, silverback, also less frequently, gray boss, is an adult male over 12 years old with an area of silver hair on his back. The silverback is a figure of authority responsible for protecting his family. A slimy chimp is slang and it is offensive. It means a human and it refers to sweat on their hairless skin. Vining is casual play and it's a reference to vine swinging. Hello, I am Ivan. I am a gorilla. It's not as easy as it looks. Names. People call me the freeway gorilla, the ape at exit eight, the one and only Ivan Mighty Silverback. The names are mine, but they're not me. I am Ivan, just Ivan, only Ivan. Humans waste words. They toss them like banana peels and leave them to rot. Everyone knows the peels are the best part. I suppose you think gorillas can't understand you. Of course, you probably also think we can't walk upright. Try knuckle walking for an hour. You tell me. Which way is more fun? Patience. I've learned to understand human words over the years, but understanding human speech is not the same as understanding humans. Humans speak too much. They chatter like chimps, crowding the world with their noise even when they have nothing to say. It took me some time to recognize all those human sounds, to weave words into things, but I was patient. Patient is a useful way to be when you're an ape. Gorillas are as patient as stones. Humans, not so much. How I look. I used to be a wild gorilla, and I still look the part. I have a gorilla's shy gaze, a gorilla's sly smile. I wear a snowy saddle of fur, the uniform of a silverback. When the sun warms my back, I cast a gorilla's majestic shadow. In my size, humans see a test of themselves. They hear fighting words on the wind, when all I'm thinking is how the late day sun reminds me of a ripe nectarine. I'm mightier than any human, 400 pounds of pure power. My body looks made for battle. My arms, outstretched, span taller than the tallest human. My family tree spreads wide as well. I am a great ape, and you are a great ape, and so are chimpanzees and orangutans and bonobos, all of us distant and distrustful cousins. I know this is troubling. I, too, find it hard to believe there is a connection across time and space, linking me to a race of ill-mannered clowns, chimps. There's no excuse for them. The Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade I live in a human habitat called the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade. We are conveniently located off I-95, with shows at 2, 4, and 7, 365 days a year. 
Mac says that when he answers the trilling phone. Mac says that when he answers the trilling telephone. Mac works here at the mall. He is the boss. I work here too. I am the gorilla. At the big top mall, a creaky music carousel spins all day, and monkeys and parrots live amid the merchants. In the middle of the mall is a ring with benches where humans can sit on their rumps while they eat soft pretzels. The floor is covered with sawdust made of dead trees. My domain is at one end of the ring. I live here because I am too much gorilla and not enough human. Stella's domain is next to mine. Stella is an elephant. She and Bob, who is a dog, are my dearest friends. At present, I do not have any gorilla friends. My domain is made of thick glass and rusty metal and rough cement. Stella's domain is made of metal bars. The sun bear's domain is wood. The parrot's is wire mesh. Three of my walls are glass. One of them is cracked, and a small piece about the size of my hand is missing from its bottom corner. I made the hole with a baseball bat Matt gave me for my sixth birthday. After that, he took the bat away, but he let me keep the baseball that came with it. A jungle scene is painted on one of my domain walls. It has a waterfall without water and flowers, without scent, and trees without roots. I didn't paint it, but I enjoy the way the shapes flow across my wall, even if it isn't much of a jungle. I'm lucky my domain has three windowed walls. I can see the whole mall and a bit of the world beyond. The frantic pinball machines, the pink billows of cotton candy, the vast and treeless parking lot. Beyond the lot is a freeway where cars stampede without end. A giant sign at its edge beckons them to stop and rest like gazelles at a watering hole. The sign is faded, the colors bleeding, but I know what it says. Mac read, read its words aloud one day. Come to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan, Mighty Silverback. Sadly, I cannot read, although I wish I could. Reading stories would make a fine way to fill my empty hours. Once, however, I was able to enjoy a book left in my domain by one of my keepers. It tasted like termite. The freeway billboard has a drawing of Mac in his clown clothes and Stella on her hind legs and an angry animal with fierce eyes and unkempt hair. That animal is supposed to be me, but the artist made a mistake. I am never angry. Anger is precious. A silverback uses anger to maintain order and warn his troop of danger. When my father beat his chest, it was to say, Beware. Listen. I am in charge. I am angry to protect you, because that is what I was born to do. Here in my domain, there is no one to protect. The littlest big top on earth. My neighbors here at the Big Top Mall know many tricks. They are an educated lot, more accomplished than I am. One of my neighbors plays baseball, although she is a chicken. Another drives a fire truck, although he is a rabbit. I used to have a neighbor, a sleek and thoughtful seal, who could balance a ball on her nose from dawn till dusk. Her voice was like a, the throaty bark of a dog chained outside on a cold night. Children wished on pennies and tossed them into her plastic pool. They glowed on the bottom like flat copper stones. The seal was hungry one day or bored, perhaps, so she ate 100 pennies. Mac said she'd be fine. He was mistaken. Mac calls our show the littlest big top on earth. Every day at 2, 4, and 7, humans fan themselves, drink sodas, applaud. Babies wail. Mac, dressed like a clown, pedals a tiny bike. A dog named Snickers rides on Stella's back. Stella sits on a stool. It is a very sturdy stool. I don't do any tricks. Max says it's enough for me to be me. Stella told me that some circuses move from town to town. They have humans who dangle on ropes twining from the tops of tents. They have grumbling lions with gleaming teeth and a snaking line of elephants, each clutching the limp tail in front of her. The elephants look far off into the distance so they won't see the humans who want to see them. Our circus doesn't migrate. 
We sit where we are like an old beast too tired to push on. After our show, humans forage through the stores. A store is where humans buy things they don't need to survive. At the Big Top Mall, some stores sell new things, things like balloons and t-shirts and caps to cover the gleaming heads of humans. Some stores sell old things, things that smell dusty and damp and long forgotten. All day, I watch humans scurry from store to store. They pass their green paper, dry as old leaves and smelling of a thousand hands, back and forth and back again. They hunt frantically, stalking, pushing, grumbling. Then they leave, clutching bags filled with things, bright things, soft things, big things. But no matter how full the bags, they always come back for more. Humans are clever indeed. They spin pink clouds you can eat. They build domains with flat waterfalls. But they are lousy hunters. Gone. Some animals live privately, unwatched. But that is not my life. My life is flashing lights and pointing fingers and uninvited visitors. Inches away, humans flatten their little hands against the wall of glass that separates us. The glass says you are this and we are that, and that is how it will always be. Humans leave their fingerprints behind, sticky with candy, slick with sweat. Each night, a weary man comes to wipe them away. Sometimes I press my nose against the glass. My nose print, like your fingerprint, is the first and last and only one. The man wipes the glass, and then I am gone. Artists. Here in my domain, I do not have much to do. You can only throw so many me balls at humans before you get bored. A me ball is made by rolling up dung until it's the size of a small apple, then letting it dry. I always keep a few on hand. For some reason, my visitors never seem to carry any. In my domain, I have a tire swing, a baseball, a tiny plastic pool filled with dirty water, and even an old TV. I have a stuffed toy gorilla, too. Julia, the daughter of the weary man who cleans the mall each night, gave it to me. The gorilla has empty eyes and floppy limbs, but I sleep with it every night. I call it not Tag. Tag was my twin sister's name. Julia is ten years old. She has hair like black glass and a wide half-moon smile. She and I have a lot in common. We are both great apes, and we are both artists. It was Julia who gave me my first crayon, a stubby blue one, slipped through the broken spot in my glass along with a folded piece of paper. I knew what to do with it. I'd watch Julia draw. When I dragged the crayon across the paper, it left a trail in its wake like a slithering blue snake. Julia's drawings are wild with color and movement. She draws things that aren't real, clouds that smile and cars that swim. She draws until her crayons break and her paper rips. Her pictures are like pieces of a dream. I can't draw dreamy pictures. I never remember my dreams, although sometimes I awaken with my fist clenched and my heart hammering. My drawings seem pale and timid next to Julia's. She draws the ideas in her head. I draw the things in my cage, simple items that fill my days. An apple core, a banana peel, a candy wrapper. I often eat my subjects before I draw them. But even though I draw the same things over and over again, I never get bored with my art. When I'm drawing, that's all I think about. I don't think about where I am, about yesterday or tomorrow. I just move my crayons across the paper. Humans don't always seem to recognize what I've drawn. They squint, cock their heads, murmur. I'll draw a banana, a perfectly lovely banana, and they'll say, it's a yellow airplane, or it's a duck without wings. That's all right. I'm not drawing for them. I'm drawing for me. Max soon realized that people will pay for a picture made by a gorilla, even if they don't know what it is. Now, I draw every day. My work sells for $20. A piece, 25 with a frame, at the gift shop near my domain. If I get tired and need a break, I eat my crayons. Shapes and clouds. I think I've always been an artist. Even as a baby still clinging to my mother, I had an artist's eye. I saw shapes in the clouds and sculptures in the tumbled stones at the bottom of a stream. 
I grabbed at colors, the crimson flower just out of reach, the ebony bird streaking past. I don't remember much about my early life, but I do remember this. Whenever I got the chance, I would dip my fingers into cool mud and use my mother's back for a canvas. She was a patient soul, my mother. Imagination. Someday, I hope I can draw the way Julia draws, imagining worlds that don't yet exist. I know what most humans think. They think gorillas don't have imaginations. They think we don't remember our past or ponder our futures. Come to think of it, I suppose they have a point. Mostly, I think about what is, not what could be. I've learned not to get my hopes up. The loneliest gorilla in the world. When the Big Top Mall was first built, it smelled of new paint and fresh hay, and humans came to visit from morning till night. They drifted past my domain like logs on a lazy river. Lately, a day might go by without a single visitor. Max says he's worried. He says I'm not cute anymore. He says, Ivan, you've lost your magic, old guy. You used to be a hit. It's true that some of my visitors don't linger the way they used to. They stare through the glass. They cluck their tongues. They frown while I watch my TV. He looks lonely, they say. Not long ago, a little boy stood before my glass, tears streaming down his smooth red cheeks. He must be the loneliest gorilla in the world, he said, clutching his mother's hand. At times like that, I wish humans could understand me the way I can understand them. It's not so bad, I wanted to tell the little boy. With enough time, you can get used to almost anything. TV. My visitors are often surprised when they see the TV Mac put in my domain. They seem to find it odd, the sight of a gorilla staring at tiny humans in a box. Sometimes I wonder, though, isn't the way they stare at me sitting in my tiny box just as strange? My TV is old. It doesn't always work, and sometimes days will go by before anyone remembers to turn it on. I'll watch anything, but I'm particularly fond of cartoons with their bright jungle colors. I especially enjoy it when someone slips on a banana peel. Bob, my dog friend, loves TV almost as much as I do. He prefers to watch professional bowling and cat food commercials. Bob and I have seen many romance movies, too. In a romance, there is much hugging and sometimes face licking. I have yet to see a single romance starring a gorilla. We also enjoy old Western movies. In a Western, someone always says, this town ain't big enough for the both of us, Sheriff. In a Western, you can tell who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. And the good guys always win. Bob says Westerns are nothing like real life. The Nature Show. I've been in my domain for 9,855 days. Alone. For a while, when I was young and foolish, I thought I was the last gorilla on earth. I tried not to dwell on it. Still, it's hard to stay upbeat when you think there are no more of you. Then one night, after I watched a movie about men in black hats with guns and feeble-minded horses, a different show came on. It was not a cartoon, not a romance, not a western. I saw a lush forest. I heard birds murmuring. The grass moved. The trees rustled. Then I saw him. He was a bit threadbare and scrawny and not as good-looking as I am, to be honest. But sure enough, he was a gorilla. As suddenly as he'd appeared, the gorilla vanished, and in his place was a scruffy white animal called, I learned, a polar bear, and then a chubby water creature called a manatee, and then another animal, and another. All night, I sat wondering about the gorilla I'd glimpsed. Where did he live? Would he ever come to visit? If there was a he somewhere, could there be a she as well? Or was it just the two of us in all the world trapped in our own separate boxes? Stella. Stella says she is sure I will see another real live gorilla someday. And I believe her because she is even older than I am and has eyes like black stars and knows more than I will ever know. Stella is a mountain. Next to her, I am a rock, and Bob is a grain of sand. 
Every night when the stores close and the moon washes the world with milky light, Stella and I talk. We don't have much in common, but we have enough. We are huge and alone, and we both love yogurt raisins. Sometimes Stella tells stories of her childhood, of leafy canopies hidden by mist and the busy songs of flowing water. Unlike me, she recalls every detail of her past. Stella loves the moon with its untroubled smile. I love the feel of the sun on my belly. She says, it is quite a belly, my friend. And I say, thank you, and so is yours. We talk, but not too much. Elephants, like gorillas, do not waste words. Stella used to perform in a large and famous circus, and she still does some of those tricks for our show. During one stunt, Stella stands on her hind legs while Snickers jumps on her head. It's hard to stand on your hind legs when you weigh more than 40 men. If you are a circus elephant you stand on your, and you stand on your hind legs while a dog jumps on your head, you get a treat. If you do not, the claw stick comes swinging. Elephant hide is thick as bark on an ancient tree, but a claw stick can pierce it like a leaf. Once, Stella saw a trainer hit a bull elephant with a claw stick. A bull is like a silverback, noble, contained, calm like a cobra is calm. When the claw stick caught into the bull's flesh, he tossed the trainer into the air with his tusk. The man flew, Stella said, like an ugly bird. She never saw the bull again. Stella's trunk. Stella's trunk is a miracle. She can pick up a single peanut with elegant precision, tickle a passing mouse, tap the shoulder of a dozing keeper. Her trunk is remarkable, but still it can't unlatch the door of her tumble-down domain. Circling Stella's legs are long-ago scars from the chains she wore as a youth. Her bracelets, she calls them. When she worked at the famous circus, Stella had to balance on a pedestal for her most difficult trick. One day, she fell off and injured her foot. When she went lame and lagged behind the other elephants, the circus sold her to Mac. Stella's foot never healed completely. She limps when she walks, and sometimes her foot gets infected when she stands in one place for too long. Last winter, Stella's foot swelled to twice its normal size. She had a fever, and she lay on the damp, cold floor of her domain for five days. They were very long days. Even now, I'm not sure she's completely better. She never complains, though, so it's hard to know. At the Big Top Mall, no one bothers with iron shackles. A bristly rope tied to a bolt in the floor is all that's required. They think I'm too old to cause trouble, Stella says. Old age, she says, is a powerful disguise. A plan. It's been two days since anyone's come to visit. Mac is in a bad mood. He says we are losing money hand over fist. He says he is going to sell the whole lot of us. When Thelma, a blue and yellow macaw, demands, Kiss me, big boy, for the third time in ten minutes, Mac throws a soda can at her. Thelma's wings are clipped so that she can't fly, but she can still hop. She leaps aside just in the nick of time. Pucker up, she says with a shrill whistle. Mac stomps to his office and slams the door shut. I wonder if my visitors have grown tired of me. Maybe if I learn a trick or two, it will help. Humans do seem to enjoy watching me eat. Luckily, I am always hungry. I am a gifted eater. A silverback must eat 45 pounds of food a day if he wants to stay a silverback. 45 pounds of fruit and leaves and seeds and stems and bark and vines and rotten wood. Also, I enjoy the occasional insect. I'm going to try to eat more. Maybe then we will get more visitors. Tomorrow, I will eat 50 pounds of food. Maybe even 55. That should make Mac happy. Bob. I explain my plan to Bob. Ivan, he says, trust me on this one. The problem is not your appetite. He hops onto my chest and licks my chin, checking for leftovers. Bob is a stray, which means he does not have a permanent address. 
He is so speedy, so wily, that mall workers long ago gave up trying to catch him. Bob can sneak into cracks and crevices like a tracked rat. He lives well off the ends of hot dogs he pulls from the trash. For dessert, he laps up spill spilled lemonade and splattered ice cream cones. I've tried to share my food with Bob, but he is a picky eater and says he prefers to hunt for himself. Bob is tiny, wiry, and fast like a barking squirrel. He is nut-colored and big-eared. His tail moves like weeds in the wind, spiraling, dancing. Bob's tail makes me dizzy and confused. It has meanings within meanings, like human words. I am sad, it says. I am happy, it says. Beware, I may be tiny, but my teeth are sharp. Gorillas don't have any use for tails. Our feelings are uncomplicated. Our rumps are unadorned. Bob used to have three brothers and two sisters. Humans tossed them out of a truck onto the freeway when they were a few weeks old. Bob rolled into a ditch. The others did not. His first night on the hot highway, Bob slept in the icy mud of the ditch. When he awoke, he was so cold that his legs would not bend for an hour. The next night, Bob slept under some dirty hay near the Big Top Mall garbage bins. The following night, Bob found the spot in the corner of my domain where the glass is broken. I dreamed that I'd eaten a furry donut, and when I woke in the dark, I discovered a tiny puppy snoring on top of my belly. It had been so long since I'd felt the comfort of another's warmth that I wasn't sure what to do. Not that I hadn't had visitors. Mac had been in my domain, of course, and many other keepers. I'd seen my share of rats zip past, and the occasional wayward sparrow had fluttered in through a hole in my ceiling. But they never stayed long. I didn't move all night for fear of waking Bob. Wild. Once I asked Bob why he didn't want a home. Humans, I'd noticed, seemed to be irrationally fond of dogs, and I could see why a puppy would be easier to cuddle with than, say, a gorilla. Everywhere is my home, Bob answered. I am a wild beast, my friend, untamed and undaunted. I told Bob he could work in the shows like Snickers, the poodle who rides Stella. Bob said Snickers sleeps on a pink pillow in Mac's office. He said she eats foul-smelling meat from a can. He made a face, his lips curled, revealing tiny needles of teeth. Poodles, he said, are parasites. Picasso. Matt gives me a fresh crayon, a yellow one, and ten pieces of paper. Time to earn your keep, Picasso, he mutters. I wonder who this Picasso is. Does he have a tire swing like me? Does he ever eat his crayons? I know I have lost my magic, so I try my very best. I clutch the crayon and think. I scan my domain. What is yellow? A banana. I draw a banana. The paper tears, but only a little. I lean back, and Mac picks up the drawing. Another day, another scribble, he says. One down, nine to go. What else is yellow? I wonder, scanning my domain. I draw another banana, and then I draw eight more. Three visitors. Three visitors are here. A woman, a boy, a girl. I strut across my domain for them. I dangle from my tire swing. I eat three banana peels in a row. The boy spits at my window. The girl throws a handful of pebbles. Sometimes I'm glad the glass is there. My visitors return. After the show, the spit pebble children come back. I display my impressive teeth. I splash in my filthy pool. I grunt and hoot. I eat and eat and eat some more. The children pound their pathetic chests. They toss more pebbles. Slimy chimps, I mutter. I throw a me ball at them. Sometimes I wish the glass were not there. Sorry. I'm sorry I called those children slimy chimps. My mother would be ashamed of me. Julia. Like the spit pebble children, Julia is a child, but that, after all, is not her fault. While her father, George, cleans the mall each night, Julia sits by my domain. She could sit anywhere she wants, by the carousel, in the empty food court, on the bleachers coated in sawdust. But I am not bragging when I say that she always chooses to sit with me. 
I think it's because we both love to draw. Sarah, Julia's mother, used to help clean them all. But when she got sick and grew pale and stooped, Sarah stopped coming. Every night, Julia offers to help George, and every night he says firmly, Homework, Julia. The floors will just get dirty again. Homework, I have discovered, involves a sharp pencil and thick books and long sighs. I enjoy chewing pencils. I'm sure I would excel at homework. Sometimes Julia dozes off, and sometimes she reads her books, but mostly she draws pictures and talks about her day. I don't know why people talk to me, but they often do. Perhaps it's because they think I can't understand them. Or perhaps it's because I can't talk back. Julia likes science and art. She doesn't like Lila Burpee, who teases her because her clothes are old, and she, she does like Deshaun Williams, who teases her too, but in a nice way. And she would like to be a famous artist when she grows up. Sometimes Julia draws me. I am an elegant fellow in her pictures, with my silver back gleaming like moon on moss. I never look angry, the way I do on the fading billboard by the highway. I always look a bit sad, though. Drawing Bob. I love Julia's pictures of Bob. She draws him flying across the page, a blur of feet and fur. She draws him motionless, peeking out from behind a trash can or the soft hill of my belly. Sometimes in her drawings, Julia gives Bob wings or a lion's mane. Once, she gave him a tortoise shell. But the best thing she ever gave him wasn't a drawing. Julia gave Bob his name. For a long time, no one knew what to call Bob. Now and then, a mall worker would try to approach him with a tidbit. Here, doggy, they'd call, holding out a french fry. Come on, pooch, they'd say. How about a little piece of sandwich? But he would always vanish into the shadows before anyone could get too close. One afternoon, Julia decided to draw the little dog curled up in the corner of my domain. First, she watched him for a long time, chewing on her thumbnail. I could tell she was looking at him the way an artist looks at the world when she's trying to understand it. Finally, she grabbed her pencil and set to work. When she was finished, she held up the page. There he was, the tiny, big-eared dog. He was smart and cunning, but his gaze was wistful. Under the picture were three bold, confident marks, circled in black. I was pretty certain it was a word, even though I couldn't read it. Julia's father peered over her shoulder. That's him exactly, he said, nodding. He pointed to the circled marks. I didn't realize his name was Bob, he said. Me either, said Julia. She smiled. I had to draw him first. Bob and Julia. Bob will not let humans touch him. He says their scent upsets his digestion. But every now and then I see him sitting at Julia's feet. Her fingers move gently, just behind his right ear. Mac. Usually Mac leaves after the last show, but tonight he is in his office working late. When he's done, he stops by my domain and stares at me for a long time while he drinks from a brown bottle. George joins him, broom in hand, and Mac says the thing he always says. How about that game last night? And, business has been slow, but it'll get better, you'll see. And, don't forget to empty the trash. Mac glances over at the picture Julia is drawing. What are you making? he asks. It's for my mom, Julia says. It's a flying dog. She holds up her drawing, eyeing it critically. She likes airplanes. And dogs. Hmm. Mac murmurs, sounding unconvinced. He looks at George. How's the wife doing anyway? About the same, George says. She has good days and bad days. Yeah, don't we all, Mac says. Mac starts to leave, then pauses. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a crumpled green bill, and presses it into George's hand. Here, Mac says with a shrug. Buy the kids some more crayons. Mac is already out the door before George can yell. Thanks. Not sleepy. Stella, I say after Julia and her father go home, I can't sleep. Of course you can, she says. You are the king of sleepers. Shh, Bob says from his perch on my belly. I'm dreaming about chili fries. I'm tired, I say, but I'm not sleepy. What are you tired of? Stella asks. I think for a while. It's hard to put into words. 
Gorillas are not complainers. We're dreamers, poets, philosophers, nap takers. I don't know exactly. I kick at my tire swing. I think I may be a little tired of my domain. That's because it's a cage, Bob tells me. Bob is not always tactful. I know, Stella says. It's a very small domain. And you're a very big gorilla, Bob adds. Stella, I ask. Yes. I noticed you were limping more than usual today. Is your leg bothering you? Just a little, Stella answers. I sigh. Bob resettles. His ears flick. He drools a bit, but I don't mind. I'm used to it. Try eating something, Stella says. That always makes you happy. I eat an old brown carrot. It doesn't help, but I don't tell Stella. She needs to sleep. You could try remembering a good day, Stella suggests. That's what I do when I can't sleep. Stella remembers every moment since she was born. Every scent, every sunset, every slight, every victory. You know I can't remember much, I say. There's a difference, Stella says gently, between can't remember and won't remember. That's true, I admit. Not remembering can be difficult, but I've had a lot of time to work on it. Memories are precious, Stella adds. They help tell us who we are. Try remembering all your keepers. You always liked Carl, the one with the harmonica. Carl, yes. I remember how he gave me a coconut when I was still a juvenile. It took me all day to open it. I try to recall other keepers I have known, the humans who cleaned my domain and prepared my food and sometimes kept me company. There was Juan, who poured Pepsis into my waiting mouth, and Katrina, who used to poke me with a broom when I was sleeping, and Ellen, who sang, How much is that monkey in the window? with a sad smile while she scrubbed my water bowl. And there was Gerald, who once brought me a box of fat, sweet strawberries. Gerald was my favorite keeper. I haven't had a real keeper in a long time. Max says he doesn't have the money to pay for an ape babysitter. These days, George cleans my cage and Mac is the one who feeds me. When I think about all the people who have taken care of me, mostly it's Mac, I recall, day in and day out, year after year after year. Mac, who bought me and raised me and says I'm no longer cute. As if a silverback could ever be cute. Moonlight falls on the frozen carousel, on the silent popcorn stand, on the stall of leather belts that smell like long-gone cows. The heavy work of Stella's breathing sounds like the wind in trees, and I wait for sleep to find me. The Beetle. Matt gives me a new black crayon and a fresh pile of paper. It's time to work again. I smell the crayon, roll it in my hands, press the sharp point against my palm. There's nothing I love more than a new crayon. I search my domain for something to draw. What is black? An old banana peel would work, but I've eaten them all. Not tag is brown. My little pool is blue. The yogurt raisin I'm saving for this afternoon is white, at least on the outside. Something moves in the corner. I have a visitor. A shiny beetle has stopped by. Bugs often wander through my domain on their way to somewhere else. Hello, beetle, I say. He freezes, silent. Bugs never want to chat. The beetle's an attractive bug, with a body like a glossy nut. He's black as a starless night. That's it. I'll draw him. It's hard making a picture of something new. I don't get the chance that often. But I try. I look at the beetle, who's being kind enough not to move, then back at my paper. I draw his body, his legs, his little antenna, his sour expression. I'm lucky. The beetle stays all day. Usually, bugs don't linger when they visit. I'm beginning to wonder if he's feeling all right. Bob, who's been known to munch on bugs from time to time, offers to eat him. I tell Bob that won't be necessary. I'm just finishing my last picture when Mac returns. George and Julia are with him. Mac enters my domain and picks up a drawing. What the heck is this? He asks. Beats me what Ivan thinks he's drawing. This is a picture of nothing. A big black nothing. Julia is standing just outside my domain. Can I see? She asks. Mac holds my picture up to the window. Julia tilts her head. She squeezes one eye shut. Then she opens her eye and scans my domain. I know, she exclaims. It's a beetle. See that beetle over there by Ivan's pool? 
Man, I just sprayed this place for bugs. Mac walks over to the beetle and lifts his foot. Before Mac can stomp, the beetle skitters away, disappearing through a crack in the wall. Mac turns back to my drawings. So you figure this is a beetle, huh? If you say so, kid. Oh, that's a beetle for sure, Julia says, smiling at me. I know a beetle when I see one. It's nice, I think, having a fellow artist around. Change. Stella is the first to notice the change, but soon we all feel it. A new animal is coming to the Big Top Mall. How do we know this? Because we listen, we watch, and most of all, we sniff the air. Humans always smell odd when change is in the air, like rotten meat with a hint of papaya. Guessing. Bob fears our new neighbor will be a giant cat with slitted eyes and a coiled tail. But Stella says a truck will arrive this afternoon carrying a baby elephant. How do you know? I ask. I sample the air, but all I smell is caramel corn. I love caramel corn. I can hear her, Stella says. She's crying for her mother. I listen. I hear the cars charging past. I hear the snore of the sun bears in their wire domain. But I don't hear any elephants. You're just hoping, I say. Stella closes her eyes. No, she says softly. Not hoping. Not at all. Jombo. My TV is off, so while we wait for the new neighbor, I ask Stella to tell us a story. Stella rubs her right foot against the, against the wall. Her foot is swollen again, an ugly deep red. If you're not feeling well, Stella, I say, you could take a nap and tell us a story later. I'm fine, she says, and she carefully shifts her weight. Tell us the Jombo story, I say. It's a favorite of mine, but I don't think Bob has ever heard it. Because she remembers everything, Stella knows many stories. I like colorful tales with black beginnings and stormy middles and cloudless blue sky endings. But any story will do. I'm not in a position to be picky. Once upon a time, Stella begins, there was a human boy. He was visiting a gorilla family at a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Bob asks. He's a street smart dog, but there's much he hasn't seen. A good zoo, Stella says, is a large domain, a wild cage, a safe place to be. It has room to roam and humans who don't hurt. She pauses, considering her words. A good zoo is how humans make amends. Stella moves a bit, groaning softly. The boy stood on a wall, she continues, watching, pointing, but he lost his balance and fell into the wild cage. Humans are clumsy, I interrupt. If only they would knuckle walk, they wouldn't topple so often. Stella nods. A good point, Ivan. In any case, the boy lay in a motionless heap while the humans gasped and cried. The silverback, whose name was Jombo, examined the boy, as was his duty, while his troop watched from a safe distance. Jombo stroked the child gently. He smelled the boy's pain, and then he stood watch. When the boy awoke, his humans cried out, Stay still! Don't move! Because they were certain, humans are always certain about things, that Jombo would crush the boy's life from him. The boy moaned. The crowd waited, hushed, expecting the worst. Jombo led his troop away. Men came down on ropes and whisked the child to waiting arms. Was the boy all right? Bob asks. He wasn't hurt, Stella says. Although, I wouldn't be surprised if his parents hugged him many times that night in between their scoldings. Bob, who has been chewing his tail, pauses, tilting his head. Is that a true story? I always tell the truth, Stella replies. Although, I sometimes confuse the facts. Lucky. I've heard the Jombo story many times. Stella says that humans found it odd that the huge silverback didn't kill the boy. Why, I wonder... Was that so surprising? The boy was young, scared, alone. He was, after all, just another great ape. Bob nudges me with his cold nose. Ivan, he says, why aren't you and Stella in a zoo? I look at Stella. She looks at me. She smiles sadly with her eyes, just a little, the way only elephants can do. Just lucky, I guess, she says. 
arrival. The new neighbor arrives after the four o'clock show. When the truck comes lumbering toward the parking lot, Bob scampers over to inform us. Bob always knows what's happening. He's a useful friend to have, especially when you can't leave your domain. With a groan, Mac lifts the sliding metal door near the food court, the place where deliveries are made. A big white truck is backing up to the door, belching smoke. When the driver opens the truck, I know that Stella is right. A baby elephant is inside. I see her trunk poking out from the blackness. I'm glad for Stella, but when I glance at her, I see she is not glad at all. Stand back, everyone, Mac yells. We've got a new arrival. This is Ruby, folks. Six hundred pounds of fun to save our sorry butts. This gal is going to sell us some tickets. Mac and two men climb into the black cave of the truck. We hear noise, scuffling, a word Mac uses when he's angry. Ruby makes noise, too, like one of the little trumpets they sell at the gift store. Move, Mac says, but still there is no Ruby. Move, he says again. We haven't got all day. Inside her domain, Stella paces as much as she's able. Two steps one way, two steps another. She slaps her trunk against rusty metal bars. She grumbles. Stella, I ask, did you hear the baby? Stella mutters something under her breath, a word she uses when she's angry. Relax, Stella, I say. It will be okay. Ivan, Stella says. It will never, ever be okay. And I know enough to stop talking. Stella helps. The men are still yelling. Some of the yelling is at each other, but most of it is at Ruby. We hear scrambling, pounding, shifting. The side of the truck shudders. I'm starting to like this elephant, Bob whispers. I'm getting the big one, Mac says. Maybe she can coax the stupid brat out of the truck. Mac opens Stella's door. Come on, girl, he urges. He unties the rope attached to the floor bolt. Stella pushes past Mac, nearly knocking him over. She rushes as best she can, limping heavily, toward the open back door of the truck. She catches her swollen foot on the edge of the ramp and winces. Blood trickles down. Halfway up the ramp, she pauses. The noise in the truck stops. Ruby falls silent. Slowly, Stella makes her way up the rest of the ramp. It groans under her weight, and I can tell how much she is hurting by the awkward way she moves. At the top of the incline, she stops. She pokes her trunk into the emptiness. We wait. The tiny gray trunk appears again. Shyly, it reaches out, tasting the air. Stella curls her own trunk around the babies. They make soft, rumbling sounds. We wait some more. A hush falls over the entire Big Top Mall. Thud. Thud. Step. Step. Pause. Step. Step. Pause. And there she is, so small she can fit underneath Stella with room to spare. Her skin sags as she sways unsteadily as she makes her way down the ramp. Not the greatest specimen, Max says, but I got her cheap from this bankrupt circus out west. They had her shipped over from Africa. Only had her a month before they went bust, he gestures toward Ruby. Thing is, people love babies. Baby elephants, baby gorillas, heck, give me a baby alligator and I could make a killing. Stella ushers Ruby toward her domain. Mac and the two men follow. At Stella's door, Ruby hesitates. Mac gives Ruby a shove, but she doesn't budge. Dog, gone it, get a clue, Ruby, he mutters. But Ruby isn't moving and neither is Stella. Mac grabs a broom. He raises it. Instantly, Stella steps in front of Ruby to shield her. Get in the cage, both of you, Mac shouts. Stella stares at Mac, considering. Gently but firmly, using her trunk, she nudges Ruby into her domain. Only then does Stella enter. Mac slams the door shut with a clang. I see two trunks entwining, entwined. I hear Stella whispering. Poor kid, says Bob. Welcome to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan. Old news. When Julia comes, she sits by Stella's domain and watches the new baby. She barely talks to me. Stella doesn't talk to me either. She is too busy nuzzling Ruby. She is cute, little Ruby, with her ears flapping like palm leaves, but I am handsome and strong. 
Bob trots a circle around my belly before settling down in just the right spot. Give it up, Ivan, he says. You're old news. Julia gets out a piece of paper and a pencil. I can see that she is drawing Ruby. I move to the corner of my domain to pout. Bob grumbles. He doesn't like it when I disrupt his naps. Homework, Julia's father scolds. Julia sighs and puts her drawing aside. I grunt and Julia glances in my direction. Poor old Ivan, she says. I've been ignoring you, haven't I? I grunt again, a dignified, indifferent grunt. Julia thinks for a moment, then she smiles. She walks over to my domain, to the spot in the corner where the glass is broken. She slides paper through. She rolls a pencil across my cement floor. You can draw the baby elephant too, Julia says. I bite the pencil in half with my magnificent teeth. Then I eat some paper. Tricks. Even after Julia and her father leave, I try to keep sulking, but it's no use. Gorillas are not, by nature, powders. Stella, I call. It's a full moon, did you see? Sometimes when we are lucky, we catch a glimpse of the moon through the skylight in the food court. I did, Stella says. She is whispering, and I realize that Ruby must be asleep. Is Ruby all right? I ask. She's too thin, Ivan, Stella says. Poor baby. She was in that truck for days. Mac bought her from a circus the same way he bought me, but she hadn't been there long. She was born in the wild like us. Will she be okay? I ask. Stella doesn't answer my question. The circus trainers chained her to the floor, Ivan. All four feet, 23 hours a day. I puzzle over why this would be a good idea. I always try to give humans the benefit of the doubt. Why would they do that? I finally ask. To break her spirit, Stella says, so she could learn to balance on a pedestal, so she could stand on her hind legs, so a dog could jump on her back while she walked in mindless circles. I hear her tired voice and think of all the tricks Stella has learned. Introductions. When I awake the next morning, I see a little trunk poking out between the bars of Stella's domain. Hello, says a small, clear voice. I'm Ruby, she waves her trunk. Hello, I say. I'm Ivan. Are you a monkey? Ruby asks. Certainly not. Bob's ears perk up, although his eyes stay closed. He's a gorilla, he says, and I am a dog of uncertain heritage. Why did the dog climb your tummy? Ruby asks. Because it's there, Bob murmurs. Is Stella awake? I ask. Aunt Stella's asleep, Ruby says. Her foot is hurting, I think. Ruby turns her head. Her eyes are like Stella's, black and long-lashed, bottomless lakes fringed by tall grass. When is breakfast, she asks. Soon, I say, when the mall opens and the workers come. Where? Ruby twists her head in the other direction. Where are the other elephants? It's just you and Stella, I say, and for some reason, I feel we have let her down. Are there more of you? Not, I say, at the moment. Ruby picks up a piece of hay and considers it. Do you have a mom and dad? Well, I used to. Everyone has parents, Bob explains. It's unavoidable. Before the circus, I used to live with my mom and my aunts and my sisters and my cousins, Ruby says. She drops the hay, picks it up, twirls it. They're dead. I don't know what to say. I'm not really enjoying this conversation, but I can see that Ruby isn't done talking. To be polite, I say, I'm sorry to hear that, Ruby. Humans killed them, she says. Who else, Bob asks, and we all fall silent. Stella and Ruby. All morning, Stella strokes Ruby, pats her, smells her. They flap their ears. They rumble and roar. They sway as if they're dancing. Ruby clings to Stella's tail. She slips under Stella's belly. Sometimes they just lean into each other, their trunks twirled together like jungle vines. Stella looks so happy. It's more fun to watch than any nature show I've ever seen on TV. Home of the one and only Ivan. George and Mac are out by the highway. I can see them through one of my windows. They are next to each other on tall wooden ladders. 
leaning against the billboard that tells the cars to stop and visit the one and only Ivan Mighty Silverback. George has a bucket and a long-handled broom. Mac has pieces of paper. He slaps one against the billboard. George dips the broom into a bucket. He wets the paper with the liquid from the bucket, and somehow the paper stays in place. They put up many pieces before they are done. When they climb down from the ladders, I see what they've added a picture of. I see that they've added a picture of a little elephant to the billboard. The elephant has a lopsided smile. She is wearing a red hat, and her tail curls like a pig's. She doesn't look like Ruby. She doesn't even look like an elephant. I've only known Ruby one day, and I could have drawn her better. Art lesson. Ruby asks lots of questions. She says, Ivan, why is your tummy so big? And have you ever seen a green giraffe? And can you get me one of those pink clouds that the humans are eating? When Ruby asks, what's that on your wall? I explain that it's a jungle. She says the flowers have no scent and the waterfall has no water and the trees have no roots. I'm aware of that, I say. It's art, a picture made with paint. Do you know how to make art? Ruby asks. Yes, I do, I say, and I puff up my chest just a little. I've always been an artist. I love drawing. Why do you love it? Ruby asks. I pause. I've never talked to anyone about this before. When I'm drawing a picture, I feel quiet inside. Ruby frowns. Quiet is boring. Not always. Ruby scratches the back of her neck with her trunk. What do you draw, anyway? Bananas, mostly. Things in my domain. My drawings sell at the gift store for $25 a piece with a frame. What's a frame? Ruby asks. What's a dollar? What's a gift store? I close my eyes. I'm a little sleepy, Ruby. Have you ever driven a truck? Ruby asks. I don't answer. Ivan? Ruby asks. Can Bob fly? A memory flashes past, surprising me. I think of my father snoring peacefully under the sun while I try every trick I know to wake him. Perhaps I realize he wasn't really such a sound sleeper after all. Treat. How's that foot, old girl? George asks Stella. Stella pokes her trunk between the bars. She inspects George's right shirt pocket for the treat he brings her every night without fail. George doesn't always bring me treats. Stella's his favorite, but I don't mind. She's my favorite, too. Stella sees that George's pocket is empty. She gives George a frustrated nudge with her trunk, and Julia giggles. Stella moves to George's left pocket and discovers a carrot. Nimbly, she removes it. Mac walk pa walks past. Toilet's plugged up in the men's bathroom, he says. Big mess. I'll take care of it, George sighs. Mac turns to leave. Um, before you go, Mac, George says, you might want to take a look at Stella's foot. I think it's infected again. Darn thing never does heal up right, Mac rubs his eyes. I'll keep an eye on it. Money's tight, though. Can't be calling the vet every time she sneezes. George strokes Stella's trunk. She inspects his pockets one more time, just in case. Sorry, girl, George says, as he watches Mac walk away. Elephant jokes. Ivan? Bob? I blink. The dawn sky is a smudge of gray, flecked with pink, like a picture drawn with two crayons. I can just make out Ruby in the shadows, waving hello with her trunk. Are you awake? Ruby asks. We are now, says Bob. Aunt Stella's still asleep, and I don't want to wake her, because she said her foot was hurting, but I'm really, really... Ruby pauses for a breath. Really bored. Bob opens one eye. You know what I do when I'm bored? What? Ruby asks eagerly. Bob closes his eye. I sleep. It's a little early, Ruby, I say. I'm used to getting up early. Ruby wraps her trunk around one of the bars on her door. At my old circus, we always got up when it was still dark, and then we had breakfast and we walked in a circle, and then they chained up my feet, and that really hurt. Ruby falls silent. Instantly, Bob is snoring. Ivan, Ruby asks, do you know any jokes? I especially like jokes about elephants. Um, well, let me see. I heard Mac tell one once. I yawn. Uh, how can you tell that an elephant has been in the refrigerator? How? By the footprints in the butter. Ruby doesn't react. I sit up on my elbows, trying not to disturb Bob. 
Get it? What's a refrigerator? Ruby asks. It's a human thing. A cold box with a door. They put food inside. They put food in the door? Or food in the box? And is it a big box? Ruby asks. Or a little box? I can see this is going to take a while, so I sit up all the way. Bob slides off, grumbling. I reach for my pencil, the one I snapped in half with my teeth. Here, I say, I'll draw you a picture of one. In the dim light, it takes me a minute to find a piece of the paper Julia gave me. The page is a little damp and has a smear of something orange on it. I think it's from a tangerine. I try my best to make a refrigerator. The broken pencil is not cooperating, but I do what I can. By the time I'm done, the first streaks of morning sun have appeared in flashy cartoon colors. I hold up my picture for Ruby to see. She studies it intently, her head turned so that one black eye is trained on my drawing. Wow, you made that. Is this the thing you were telling me about before? Art? Sure is. I can draw all kinds of things. I'm especially good at fruit. Can you draw a banana right now? Ruby asks. Absolutely. I turn the paper over and sketch. Wow, Ruby says again in an awed voice when I hold up the page. It looks good enough to eat. She makes a happy, lilting sound, an elephant laugh. It's like the song of a bird I recall from long ago, a tiny yellow bird with a voice like dancing water. Strange. I'd forgotten all about that bird, how she'd wake me up every morning at dawn when I was still curled safely in my mother's nest. It's a good feeling making Ruby laugh, so I draw another picture, and another, along the edges of the paper, an orange, a candy bar, a carrot. What are you two up to? Stella asks, moaning as she tries to move her sore foot. How are you this morning? I ask. Just feeling my age, Stella says. I'm fine. Ivan is making me pictures, Ruby says, and he told me a joke. I really like Ivan, Aunt Stella. Stella winks at me. Me too, she says. Ivan, want to hear my favorite joke? Ruby asks. I heard it from Maggie. She was one of the giraffes in my old circus. Sure, I say. It goes like this, Ruby clears her throat. <clears throat> what do elephants have that nothing else has? Trunks, I think, but I don't answer because I don't want to ruin Ruby's fun. I don't know, Ruby, I reply. What do elephants have that nothing else has? Baby elephants, Ruby says. Good one, Ruby, I, will, I say, watching Stella stroke Ruby's back with her trunk. Good one, Stella says softly. Children. Once I asked Stella if she'd ever had any babies. She shook her head. I never had the opportunity. You would have made a great mother, I told her. Thank you, Ivan, Stella said, clearly pleased. I like to think so. Having young ones is a big responsibility. You have to teach them how to take mud baths, of course, and emphasize the importance of fiber in their diet. She looked away, contemplating. Elephants are excellent at contemplating. I think the hardest part of being a parent, Stella added after a while, would be keeping your baby safe from harm, protecting them. The way silverbacks do in the jungle, I said. Exactly, Stella nodded. You would have been good at protecting too, I say confidently. I'm not so sure, Stella said, gazing at the iron bars surrounding her. I'm not sure at all. The parking lot. Mac and George are chatting while George cleans one of my windows. George, Mac says, frowning. There's something wrong with the parking lot, George sighs. I'll take a look as soon as I'm done with this window. What's the problem? There are cars in it. That's what's wrong, George. Cars! Mag breaks into a grin. I think things are actually starting to pick up a bit. It's got to be the billboard. Perhaps see that baby... People see that baby elephant and they just have to stop and spend their hard-earned cash. I hope so, George says. We sure could use the business. Max right. I have noticed more visitors coming since... Her, he and George added the picture of Ruby to the sign. People crowd around Ruby and Stella's domain, ooing and aahing at the sight of such a tiny elephant. I gaze out at the huge sign that makes humans stop and spend their hard-earned cash. I have to admit that the picture of Ruby is rather cute, even if she doesn't look like a real elephant. 
I wonder if Matt could add a little red hat and a curly tail to the picture of me. Maybe then more visitors would stop by my domain. I could use a few oohs and ahs myself. Ruby story. Ivan, tell me another joke, please, Ruby begs after the two o'clock show. I think I may have run out of jokes, I admit. A story, then, Ruby says. Anne still is sleeping, and there's nothing to do. I tap my chin. I'm trying hard to think. But when I gaze up at the food court skylight, I'm mesmerized by the elephant-colored clouds galloping past. Ruby taps her foot impatiently. Hmm. I know. I'll tell you a story, she says. A real, live, true one. Good idea, I say. What's it about? It's about me, Ruby lowers her voice. It's about me and how I fell into a hole. A big hole. Humans dug it. Bob pricks his ears and joins me by the window. I always enjoy a good digging story, he says. It was a big hole full of water near a village, Ruby says. I don't know why humans made it. Sometimes you just need to dig for the sake of digging, Bob reflects. We were looking for food, Ruby says. My family and I, but I wandered off and got lost and went too close to the village. Ruby looks at me, eyes wide. I was so scared when I fell into that hole. Of course you were, I say. I would have been scared too. Me too, Bob admits, and I like holes. The hole was huge. Ruby pokes her trunk between the bars and makes a circle in the air. And guess what? She doesn't wait for an answer. The water was all the way up to my neck, and I was sure I was going to die. I shudder. What happened then? I ask. I'll tell you what happened, Bob says darkly. They captured her and put her in a box and shipped her off, and here she is. Just like they did with Stella. He pauses to scratch an ear. Humans. Rats have bigger hearts. Roaches have kinder souls. Flies have... No, Bob, Ruby interrupts. You're wrong. These humans helped me. When they saw I was trapped, they grabbed ropes and they made loops around my neck and my tummy. The whole entire village helped. Even little kids and grandmas and grandpas and they all pulled and pulled and... Ruby stopped. Her lashes are wet and I know she must be remembering all the terrible feelings from that day. And they saved me, she finished in a whisper. Bob blinks. They saved you, he repeats. When I was finally out, everyone cheered, Ruby says. And the children fed me fruit. And then all those humans led me back to my family. It took the whole day to find them. No way, Bob says, still doubtful. It's true, Ruby says. Every word. Of course it's true, I say. I've heard rescue stories like that before. It's Stella's voice. She sounds weary. Slowly, she makes her way over to Ruby. Humans can surprise you sometimes. An unpredictable species, Homo sapiens. Bob still looks unconvinced. But Ruby's here now, he points out. If humans are so swell, who did that to her? I send Bob a grumpy look. Sometimes he doesn't know when to keep quiet. Ruby swallows, and I'm afraid she's going to cry. But when she speaks, her voice is strong. Bad humans killed my family, and bad humans sent me here. But that day in the hole, it was humans who saved me. Ruby leans her head on Stella's shoulder. Those humans were good. It doesn't make any sense, Bob says. I just don't understand them. I never will. You're not alone, I say. And I turn my gaze back to the racing gray clouds. We are going to stop there for this week. Oh, I love this book so far. Oh, there were a few moments that I almost cried, and I have a feeling they're probably not over, but what do you think? What are your thoughts? Who are your favorite characters so far? How do you feel for each character? Each character has a very different situation, but I think they all have a lot in common. Um, I'm really excited to read the rest of this book. If you have any questions, um, please send me a dojo message. I hope to see you in one of the Zoom sessions this week. I'm sorry that this video ended up being so long, but I want to be able to finish this novel before you leave for summer. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I will see you soon. Bye.